Was the Maltese government behind the murder of a journalist? Two years after Daphne Caruana Galizia was killed, the investigation hones in on the Prime Minister's inner circle. We ask Malta's Justice Minister if his boss covered up an assassination. I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is the Government of Malta. In her final blog post in October 2017, Daphne Caruana Galizia wrote, There are crooks everywhere you look now. The situation is desperate. Within hours, she was assassinated by a car bomb. The investigative journalist was well known in Malta for exposing corruption at the highest levels. And for her family and many of her supporters, it was that work that got her killed. Her murder has sparked a political crisis in Malta. The Prime Minister announced he would resign, his former Chief of Staff has been arrested and several close allies of the government are accused of being involved. Despite all the allegations, Prime Minister Joseph Muscat denies any wrongdoing. Well, last week, Daphne Caruana Galizia's son spoke to us here on the Newsmakers and it's clear he believes the government still has plenty to hide. In the past two weeks, uh, one sickening detail after another has emerged showing how, how very closely linked the Prime Minister and the people around him were to the cover-up of my mother's assassination. Today in court, we found out that the middleman contracted to hire hitmen to place a bomb under my mother's car seat was actually an employee of the government, and he was given this job by the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff directly. So now we already have three or four people employed in the office of the Prime Minister who are directly linked to, to the middleman in my mother's assassination. I've now put those allegations to Malta's government. I spoke to Justice Minister Owen Bonici and began by asking him whether the growing weight of evidence against the office of the Prime Minister means he should not only resign immediately, but also be investigated. What I can say uh, is that the Prime Minister left no stone unturned for this case to be solved. Once, uh, when, when Daphne Caruana Galizia's horrendous murder occurred, which was a murder which shook the whole nation, the Prime Minister immediately um, received uh, an offer from the United States to, to send over FBI, an offer which the Prime Minister immediately accepted. Secondly, when there was a middleman, alleged middleman, who said that he would spill the beans if he were to be given a pardon in order to you know, testify everything he knew about the case. The Prime Minister immediately um, gave this pardon as soon as he was convinced by inter international institutions that the evidence was corroborated. So the Prime Minister did all he could so that this murder be solved. And I think that speaks volume about his resolve in order to solve the murder. The man who was charged, the businessman Fennec, testified that Shemri, the chief of staff, now former chief of staff, had leaked information to him regarding the investigation, had divulged that his phone had been tapped and warned him of police raids in advance. So you have the chief of staff divulging information to a prime suspect, and you have two ministers implicated. You have the tourism minister, the economy minister, and bodyguards as well. Is that not enough to have the prime minister himself investigated, sir? Well, as you know, um, in Malta and elsewhere in Europe, there is the presumption of innocence. And I cannot say anything which might impute criminal responsibility on someone who has not declared to be guilty. If I do that, that would be grossly um, responsible on my part. However, what I can say at this stage is that um, the institutions worked, the rule of law worked in Malta, and people were arranged to court, and um, we, we are four square behind all the efforts to make sure that uh, the truth surfaces. If a person has done any wrongdoing, of course, he has to um, uh, shoulder the responsibilities. With regard to the Prime Minister, what I can say is that he did all he could, that a crime which occurred under his watch, under his tenure as Prime Minister, be solved in the same legislature. And that is something which doesn't occur often in Malta, that a crime of this importance be solved by under the watch of the same Prime Minister under whom the crime occurred. Yes, it certainly occurred under his watch. Are you open to the possibility that enough people 
at the highest levels of government were involved, that it can be determined that we can actually say the state itself killed Daphne Caruana Galizia. Well, uh, what, uh, what I say is that the institution, what I can say is that the institutions in Malta work closely with international agencies such as Europol and Interpol and FBI. So, um, you know, the, those institutions work together. They pull the same rope in order for truth to be surfaced. And that is why we have um, a functioning rule of law which gave results. And, you know, uh, that, that is the judicial process which is carrying on. And hopefully we can unearth the whole truth behind this horrendous murder. Rest assured that in Malta everyone was shocked by, by the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia. It's not something which we took lightly. The murder of a journalist is something very, very serious mm -hmm. in Malta and in Europe. And we, we left no stone unturned so that the case be solved. And, you know, I have to thank all the institutions who did all they could. They gave their utmost so that the truth surfaces. There is a judicial process now. We have also, we have also agreed on a public inquiry, um, which composition and terms of reference right. were agreed to with the family of Daphne Caruana Galizia. And hopefully those, those uh, in, inquir the inquiry and the judicial processes will put on the table all the information and right. all the truth. Yeah, there, there has been a big question mark about governance and justice in your country. You would accept that given the events of the past uh, two years. There were also people who egged you publicly um, they see you as someone at the top of, the, of, of a system they don't trust to give them justice. Do you accept that? Do you accept that ever since that fateful day two years ago, your government deserves to be in the spotlight and deserves to have the book thrown at it? Well, um, protesters um, in Malta are free to, to, to protest. Of course, we live in a democratic country and they are free to, to put their message across. What I can refer to is a mission of MEPs who came to Malta, who spoke to whoever they like to speak to, and they concluded by saying that um, they met the police, they met the institutions, and that they um, believe that the police has done a good job in order to um, unearth the truth. And that is, right. what, uh, is very, what is important at the end of the day, that the institutions Certainly. do their work they give their utmost so that this case is solved. Uh, yes, and you have a lot of faith in those institutions. I wonder if you were happy with the phone call that, that you had with the European Commission Vice President Vera Jourova. Were you happy with that phone call? I, I want to say two things. First of all, it's not me who has trust in the institutions only. It's not only me who has the trust in institutions, but as I said, even the MEPs who came to Malta and who spoke to the police said that the police has done a very good job in, in putting their utmost to solve this case as they, as they, uh, as did the result. But it doesn't sound as if they, they have trust in the institutions. Secondly, sir. yes. Certainly, but it doesn't sound as if they have trust in the institutions because coming out of that phone call, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is from her spokesman, uh, so, Vera Jourova insisted that the investigation has to be brought to a conclusion without any political interference. She also expressed her concern regarding the situation in Malta and more work needs to be done in Malta on maintaining an independent legal system in the country. So, you have the European Commission not trusting your institutions. You might trust them, but the Europeans are saying something is fishy here. Again, I repeat, it's not only myself who trusts the institution. There is widespread um, agreement that the police in Malta, with the help of Europol, Interpol and FBI, did their best in order to solve this murder case, which, uh, and I have to congratulate them for what they've done. Regarding the call which I had with, uh, with the Vice President Jourova, um, we, we discussed two main issues. First, the need to make sure that there is no uh, political um, effort or um, uh, political tinge to the investigations, which of course there is not, because in Malta we have a system where each major crime is, the investigation is presided over by an independent inquiring magistrate who has the task to preserve all the evidence and to conduct the investigation. So that is something which I want to make very clear. Malta um, is, is, is a European country which values the right. rule of law principles. 
Secondly, uh, during the debate, during the phone call which I had with Madame Jourova, we discussed also the reforms which we are doing in our country to promote and um, keep uh, evolving the rule of law. Right. In fact, today I have just um, informed the Maltese public that um, a major reform in the office of the Attorney General will take place as from the 18th of December. Okay, okay, and, and you said debate there with regards to the phone call. Maybe it was a Freudian slip, very finely. When it comes to Daphne Caruana Galizia, this didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't come out of nowhere. Beforehand, she was harassed. She was stalked. She was smeared. She had people following her. She had members of government, government officials, filing libel suits against her before she was killed. This woman was hounded. She was made to seem as if she was an outsider because she wanted to expose corruption and expose the truth. When it comes to talking about reforms, is that needed as well in your country? The fact that the powerful can be held to account for when they steal, for when they commit crimes? First of all, uh, I have to correct you. Um, um, even the opposition leader um, uh, in Malta had very strong words against Daphne Caruana Galizia when she used to conduct investigatory work. And uh, so it's not an issue like you're trying to okay, paint. So that, government, you know, okay, so politicians. Okay, so politicians. Politicians. Okay. Was, was, so but even, even the party in opposition. P secondly, I, yes. condemn, I, condemn, uh, I condemn any harassment coming from which place it comes against any journal. I'm very journalist, I'm very clear. I condemn any harassment done against any journalist. Here we are speaking about a European country which cherishes the values um, of, of journalism and pluralism. And, uh, you know, um, I definitely um, uh, condemn any harassment done against people, or against journalists who are doing their job. Uh, secondly, um, I have to send this message very clearly that the institutions in Malta uh, function, they work, they are independent, they do their job, and in fact, in less than, or actually in around about two years from the murder of Daphne Caruana Carizia, um, the, the, the case is in a position where um, people who were arranged to court, not only for actually committing the murder, but also allegedly um, being the brain behind the murder itself. So, um, yes, there is important progress on this case, and it means that in Malta, whoever breaks the law has uh, the rule of law running after him, because in Malta, the rule of law reigns, reigns supreme. The Justice Minister of Malta, Owen Bonnici, I thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Not all wars are waged on the battlefield. Some are fought financially. Iran and the U.S. have had a rocky relationship for years, and Washington has, on several occasions, imposed sanctions which have almost crippled Tehran's economy. In an attempt to ease the burden, the Iranian government has decided to raise petrol prices. That's led to some of the deadliest protests the country has seen in years, with security forces accused of targeting demonstrators. The Trump administration has condemned the crackdown. But isn't this what it expected when it imposed sanctions? Adam Pletz reports. Weeks of demonstrations in Iran, triggered by petrol subsidy cuts, have left hundreds dead in the worst violence since the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Amnesty International says security forces have killed at least 208 people. The Interior Minister says more than 700 banks, 70 gas stations and 140 government sites were set ablaze. Iran's Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, has backed the fuel price hike and denounced the protesters. Some people would definitely be upset by this decision, but damaging and setting fire to property is not something normal people would do. These are hooligans. He has since said those who did not instigate the protests should receive clemency. But some demonstrators are calling for the removal of the clerical leadership. Government supporters say the protesters are playing into the hands of its foes abroad. <laughs> The United States believes Iran is hiding the scale of the clampdown. The fact that Iran 
is killing perhaps thousands and thousands of people right now as we speak. That's why they cut off the internet. So they cut off the internet so people can't see what's going on. But thousands of people are being killed in Iran right now. The US strategy is to maintain maximum economic pressure on Iran. It reimposed sanctions on oil exports when it withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal in May 2018. As a result, the International Monetary Fund says the economy will contract by 9% in 2019. The US is condemning Iran's brutal crackdown, but isn't Washington's very aim to turn the Iranian people against their own government? Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. Well, we're joined now from New York by former Iranian presidential candidate Hushang Amir Ahmadi. He is the head of the American Iranian Council. Masih Ali Najad is in London. She's a journalist and human rights activist. And in Tehran is Iranian affairs analyst Said Mustafa Hoshcheshum. Good to have you all on the program. Hushang Amir Ahmadi, is all of this a natural consequence of the sanctions? The point of the sanctions was maximum pressure. Are we seeing it playing out now? Okay, Mr. Amir Ahmadi, we've lost your audio. We're going to come back to you. Oh, can you give I'm it a sorry. go? No. I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. I'm here. I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I said uh, obviously sanctions have had a major impact on Iran's economy, but even the government itself has said many, many times the sanctions are only responsible for about 20% of the problem, the Iranian economic problem even. The rest of it comes from mismanagement, from corruption, from a government that is not accountable to the people, from a clerical regime that doesn't understand the modern world, that they still, you know, live in 1400 years ago and are trying to impose an ideology that just simply doesn't work and have made Iran into a pariah. So again, Yes, sanctions have impacted, but I believe it is the mismanagement by the clerical regime, and I mean particularly clerics. I see. This country is run by 200 clerics right. who should have not been there to begin with. Okay, we're going to get into the details of the crackdown in a few moments, but Masih, do you broadly agree with Hushang Amir Ahmadi that sanctions are a small part of this puzzle? There's no doubt that sanction um, hurt our economy. But let me be clear with you. Our economy in Iran is holding hostage by revolutionary guard. And um, I have to say that uh, the corruption, mismanagement, and the clerics who are actually holding the whole economy hostage, they are hurting people uh, many, many times more than sanction. There are so many religious uh, institutions like Bunyad Mostaz Afin. They have hundreds of companies in Iran. And the Revolutionary Guard itself has a huge and large part in our economy. So that is why their corruption, their mismanagement, hurting. So I want to tell you, actually, in the streets of, uh, you know, across Iran, there were a lot of people chanting against, uh, actually, the Revolutionary Guard. Mm -hmm. They were chanting against the clerics. They were chanting against, <laughs> um, you know, the government who are sending money to Syria, to Gaza, to Lebanon. There, was no, there were no single chant against sanction or against the U.S. Um, right. president. Okay. So this is actually give you a clue okay. that the people That's itself, they, right. yeah, they're right. risking to challenge the mismanagement of the clerics. So let me, let me pose that to Mustafa Hoshchashim, that yes, sanctions play a part. They might be a contributing factor, but corruption, mismanagement, as the other two guests have said, and Iran being too busy building an empire in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere and spending the money there, that is the real cause of the people taking to the streets. Address that for me, sir. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, you just referred to your uh, other two guests, as far as I know. Um, I mean, I'll, I'm going to respond to you, but of course, uh, with regard to the allegations made by those people that are paid, according to the documents, they are paid the huge sums by the United States uh, State Department, 
And this, uh, there are the documents in the contract section of the U.S. State Department. Let's keep our eye on the ball here. Miss, uh, Let's not play the man. Let's keep our eye on the ball and the issue we're discussing. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sir. And I've been sending. And Mr. I have. Shishim. Mr. Hoshishim, people on aren't second. on the streets protesting against the them. They're protesting your, against uh, the government. Staff showing the. That's, that's a pity that your guess is actually funded okay, by Fox just, News just Agency second, and Fox News Agency. Get through with what I'm telling God. you, and then, I'll, okay. and then she would Shishim. have enough time to answer. But let's come to you and. But you I'm started from you accusation. When, no, when, you have when to give me time that I am not allegations. Okay, so let's put everybody's payroll away to and raise focus allegations on the issue against here. their Mr. own Shishim. nation. And hold on a second. Hold on a second. It doesn't matter. You, you would have time to, you know, respond. But when it comes to such allegations, when people are paid uh, to raise such allegations, that's their job. As a matter of fact, uh, they, they, they are paid to raise such allegations. And I'm not talking about uh, Mr. Uh, I mean, oh Shang Amir Ahmadi. I'm just talking about Masih Ali Nijad. So I don't care about what, what okay, they so say. Me, if okay, your let, question let, let with regard to your okay, question. So, so now, Shishim, as a matter of fact, okay, this so formula of sanctions started under President Obama. Okay, so let me move it on then, right? Let me move it on. The United Nations. Yeah, move it. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm telling I'm you. Okay, I'm moving it on because you, you, you're shooting the messenger here. Okay. So I want to move it on. The United Nations said that it has video okay, evidence go ahead. Go ahead. appearing to show that Iranian security forces are shooting to kill protesters during Iran's latest wave of demonstration. That, that comes from uh, Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Is she also on the State Department's payroll, or is there something to look at here? Hold on a second. Uh, these international bodies that you're talking about, uh, it's been proved that they have been uh, on a political agenda against the Islamic Republic. They don't have uh, agents on the field to prove their <laughs> allegations. Th this has happened frequently, that somebody they, they have announced as a uh, casualty, as a dead person killed by the government. After a few days, they have appeared on the state-run TV in Iran sound and safe and alive. That's why, if you just refer to Amnesty International, uh, reports about the number of the deaths. Uh, they say 163 are feared death. There is a yeah, but, very but legal what, difference I mean, that's because, in interpreting people are interpretation of these two reports the okay. uh, If okay, they okay, are dead or they are feared okay, dead. So they are on. not sure about, they are not even hold sure on, about Mr. their Hoshishim. own reports. Okay, what's interesting is that Rouhani spokesman Ali Rabai is taking this more seriously than you are, it seems because he's saying we will come out with an official death toll. People were killed. This is a problem. Hushang Amir Ahmadi, we have Mustafa Hosh Cheshim sure. hanging a question mark over everything that has been said preceding him. Tell me what's going on there. Well, uh, the fact on the ground speaks for itself. The fact is that the government raised actually tripled the price of, you know, gas. And that affects 6 million Iranians who make a living by, in the transportation industry just to, to begin with. And that these people did protest in the streets against that uh, price rise, as well as other corruption, corruption matters, and that they were they were killed. Now, what number? I have no exact number, but I, I'm sure the government will come up with some number when opposition as well. They, they speak in thousands and in hundreds. You know, unfortunately, uh, you know, in Iran, uh, numbers are flooding, you know, with no responsibility behind the numbers. So again, the fact on the ground is that a protest happened because of the price rise on gas, that the, the, the protesters were killed, uh, and, that, and that the guys who killed them were members of Naja, that is the, the Islamic Republic's, you know, uh, uh, security forces, sort right. of. Okay. Uh, but okay. at the same time, you know, this is a field where everybody is involved. Right. I mean, they say in the war they don't <laughs> distribute sweet. So each side tries to uh, to do what it best can. Unfortunately, the Iranian 
political situation is very messy and Indeed. that and even just, trying to have a, yeah, it, even trying to have a conversation about it gets messy Masih, what do you want to happen now it's not about me it's about people inside iran they are fed up with the islamic republic all you hear from the people across Iran, more than 100 cities, they took to the street, they risked their lives. They say, we don't want an Islamic Republic. That is actually why the government used live bullets, killed more than 500 people, arrested 7,000 people. And I want to tell you that your other guest from Tehran is funded by Revolutionary Guard, works for, he's a, a high-ranking figure, of Farce News Agency, and Farce News Agency is a, mis, uh, is, a, is a mouthpiece of Revolutionary Guard, and Revolutionary Guard actually is a terrorist organization holding <coughs> Iran economy hostage, and Revolutionary Guard took my brother hostage to keep me silent. You know, they arrested my brother in front of his two small children. Revolutionary God shoot people in and the head. And that's why you opened up lawsuit of $500 million dollars against the Iranian nation. Exactly. Yes, because not the Iranian nation. I, I sued the supreme leader of Iran. I sued Revolutionary Guard. I actually make an official complaint about the you know, Iranian judiciary system, which arrested thousands of people and tortured them and killing them. And you are working for New Jason's agency, which actually uh, forcing the journalists, forcing the bloggers, forcing the political activists to do false confession. So that is and why that I am that, not going to get... Exactly. Let me finish. Let me finish. Pretty well. What bothers me? Why? Let me finish. Let me that finish. You have you enough time steal money inside from Iran the and, and of let the me Iranian finish. Nation, let me dollars. finish. Five hundred so. million dollars, mm. which I am not going to give that money. Right now in this TV, I am saying that I'm going this money to 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 let it go. But what I want the supreme leader of Iran to be responsible. I want the rest of the world to understand that you and the supreme leader of Iran are criminals. What bothers me? You have freedom to come and talk about, you know, Iran and U.S. sanction. Uh, okay. Javad Zarif, Masum Eftekar, you're allowed to go on TV and giving your own opinion. But, but the children of Masum okay. Eftekar, the foreign minister of Iran, the children of Masih, our president are Masih in the U.S. The U.S. that you blame them, but you are sending your children in okay. the U.S. My dream is to be in my Masih, own country. I'm you're kicking me out. You're arresting my brother, and now you're telling me that why I'm okay. uh, making complaint about the supreme <laughs> leader of Iran? Messi, Mustafa, and Hushang, we'll continue this conversation soon. I've got to wrap. I thank you for joining us. No, that uh, that thank entitles you. you to work for I've Donald Trump in order to justify Mustafa, I've got to wrap. her I'm sorry. sanctions against the Iranian nation. My dream is to work with in my own nation. country. Okay, that that this is my dream, you but you torture me. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got to wrap. Yes, we're going to gonna, we're gonna drop off air. We'll continue this next time. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for watching the newsmakers. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.